and I'm going to share screen. As I am a board examiner, uh, this is not a board examination type of setup. So this is a lecture and we may have some cases and all that, but um, we will just do this as like a grand rounds. Can you guys see that? And yes. You, good. You guys can hear me also, right? All right. So, um, temporal bone, CSF leaks, uh, traumatic, iatrogenic, we can cause problems, spontaneous, related to other stuff, um, radiation issues, lots of things, uh, surger, surgery, um, unexpected or surgery expected, right? Um, skull base surgery. Um, involves crossing the dura or dural plane quite a bit. So if we see CSF either in our area or up front, um, you can certainly have a leak. So uh, there are expectations of leaks with tumor removal uh, to some extent and hopefully are reasonably low rate. Uh, over time, collectively, we have started to see more of this. Uh, these sorts of things have been described for a long, long time, but they really weren't seen very commonly, um, essentially around the entire country. And um, I have no doubt that some of this is related to um, the obesity epidemic that's, uh, that's going on. Uh, we're gonna talk about Presentation of patients with skull-based defects, um, etiology, surgical repairs, uh, implications, post-operative care, things for us to think about as well. So CSF otorrhea, right, is really CSF draining out of the ear or behind the ear. Um, talked about causes already. Um, and uh, a lot of this will focus on spontaneous CSF otorrhea um, because I think this is a common enough thing that uh, this should be within a differential of a patient with fluid in the ear. And how do they present? What's it look like, etc. cetera? Uh, gross uh, ear cross section from Netter. Uh, pretty much everybody's seen this. Um, if you focus along the skull base here, this is a cartoon, of course, but this cartoon is drawn with a plate of bone separating ear or skull base uh, from, from brain proper. And as um, everybody has seen in the clinics uh, with our patients in the operating room, uh, that plate is hypothetical. And when we uh, see a lot of our patients, this plate is moth-eaten or frankly absent with uh, just dura lining or an encephalocele hanging down. And um, we do see some interesting anatomy working at a working at a medical center also, right? Plenty of plenty of interesting scans um, that just have divots or or defects in places. Saw one, saw one last week where this bone right over the ear canal is just not there. It's just all brain down even, even to here. There's not even bone right here. So uh, we do see fairly frequently some very interesting anatomy that can pose challenges. Um, Mallory texted me this weekend with a patient who had a 2.8 centimeter, I believe, was the measure. Um, carotid aneurysm, smack dab middle of the temporal bone. So uh, these things are rare, but um, that particular lesion presents lots of challenges, especially in a young patient. And we hope that that young patient has a long life expectancy, but um, some very strange anatomy and, and physiology at times. We talk about a study we did a, a while back. Um, when we started to see a fair amount of spinal fluid leaks, we decided to look at them. So 
we actually um, created a spontaneous CSF otorrhea group. We had a, a control group that was obese with a BMI greater than 30. They all happened to have had CAT scans because they were getting cochlear implants. So a nice control group because pretty much everybody gets a scan. And then we had a uh, control group that was not obese that had a BMI of less than 30. And we did um, our regular high def um, dedicated temporal bone CAT scans and looked at some other factors. So about 30 in each group. Uh, the ages were about the same. The BMIs uh, vastly different. Um, our spontaneous CSF lead control uh, group had a BMI of about 38 on average. And um, as we see more and more obese patients in the clinic, I will tell you um, the description of he or she is of normal weight happens quite a bit um, when we're discussing these, uh, these patients. And um, 100 pounds overweight is not um, of normal weight. It may be what you're used to seeing, but it's not normal. Um, and these, uh, these numbers may change over time as we redefine what's normal weight, obesity, et cetera. But um, generally, 35 is considered morbidly obese and 30 is considered obese. Um, our control group, uh, 20 to 25, is a considered normal BMI. And um, our control group was in the normal range and our um, control group with a high BMI was, was frankly quite near our spontaneous lead group. And uh, we had a uh, high predilection of females in the leak group and about 50-50 in the other groups. When we start, when we actually measured thickness of the skull base, we actually found significant differences. And um, the cartoonish plate in the netter drawing um, doesn't necessarily hold for at least a couple of these groups. And we've explained in the paper how we've actually measured the thickness. We don't need the details right now, but for example, um, the group with the CSF leak, not necessarily where it was leaking because there's no bone there, um, but where we were measuring in the mastoid and where we were measuring um, uh, in the tegmen tympani on the next slide, we actually did find significant difference in terms of the actual thickness. So in terms of the group that had a CSF leak, um, back in the mastoid, the average thickness was about 0.9 of a millimeter. It was about 1.2 millimeters for the cochlear implant group with normal BMI. And it was about a millimeter for the um, cochlear implant group with the uh, uh, high BMI. So there does seem to be a relation here. This is in the tegmen uh, tympani. The bone tends to be thinner up there. These measurements are hard to do. And with the limitations of the CAT scans, they're really hard to do. But in the tegmen tympani, um, the skull base thickness was about 0.8 millimeters in the uh, CSF lead group. And again, about 1.3 um, in the um, normal weight cochlear implant group and about, uh, point, and about one millimeter again in the um, uh, obese cochlear implant group. So uh, we do seem to be finding these sorts of things consistently, at least how we chose to um, how we chose to measure. But again, specifically in the CSF leak group, if we measured where the leak was, there's no bone there. So we didn't just pick the spot that was leaking. We had standard spots that we measured for this particular study. Um, this particular patient here, um, that we're looking at has a fairly cartoonish type, netter type um, skull base plate drawn out here. Well, all right, this is just a CAT scan, but that's chosen specifically. But this particular patient has a mean thickness of about 1.4 millimeters. Plenty strong, plenty thick, shouldn't cause problems. This one over here looks different. Okay, plenty thick out here, moth-eaten the rest of the way. 
how much of these little air cell pockets have an eggshell thin bone across versus just brain hanging down versus across here? Well, good question, right? We actually have to see what this patient looks like. But fundamentally, this patient over here on the my right is fundamentally different than this patient over on the left at the skull base. If we look at skull base thickness with BMI, um, there's a um, low in terms of the actual amount of variation explained, right? 0.3 squared. Um, however, that's a significant correlation. And it certainly appears that with increasing BMI, the skull base thickness is less with some variation. Age didn't seem to have that much effect. Uh, so there may be there may be a little bit of decline there with age, but not significant. So skull base um, and BMI seems to be pretty strong correlation there relatively age, not so much. At least with these, at least with this group of 90 patients. Um, we actually do not have, in my opinion, enough patients in terms of really looking at um, race. Um, I think that really uh, needs a much long, larger patient cohort. We may have to go across institutions to do that. Um, we've not done that just yet, but we did not find a significant difference in terms of race or age or um, gender in terms of skull base thickness. Maybe it should be thinner in women uh, because of all the patients with leaks, etc. But again, looking at um, standardized places to measure, we did not find that. We did not find a lot of difference in terms of hypertension or diabetes or smoking, but some of this has been shown to be um, important, at least in more recent studies. So uh, we do actually find that across the skull base, not just where the leak is occurring, patients with spontaneous CSF otorrhea have um, evidence of lateral skull base attenuation. That's probably been showed centrally also with uh, the work Dr. Schlosser and his group have done. Um, Obesity is likely related, sleep apnea, diabetes, hypertension, these sort of things have been looked at in larger studies and may, may uh, have some effect or may play an important role. We will see if some of these other things change over time. Let's talk about a case here. Again, this is not a case set up like a board um, presentation, but these are what we see in the clinic. So a 65-year-old female presents with muffled hearing and pressure on the right side that has been present for three months. It is important that you ask questions about ear infections and some other things. Um, terms of are you concerned about what's going on at the eustachian tube in the back of the nose? Um, has there been bleeding from the nose? Those sorts of things. Um, these patients are often treated. We see them given some nasal steroids or somebody's put a tube in or, or whatever. And um, my recommendation is to work these patients up thinking about CSF and thinking about other causes of unilateral uh, congestion, unilateral hearing loss. On exam, generally will be morbidly obese. Average BMI is about 37. Um, and fluid behind the right ear. The right eardrum is generally not long-term retracted. Pars flaccida retraction, um, pars tensa, long-term retraction sitting on the ossicle um, and the fluid is often clear. You may see um, you may see air in there from eustachian tube valsalva maneuvers um, but you may just uh, see it without bubbles also. It generally does not have the yellowish tinge to it that chronic otitis media has. It generally does not have the very thick uh, snotty mucoid appearance. Sometimes that's fairly clear too with hypertrophic 
blood vessels and thickened eardrum. Normally the eardrum's fairly clear and you just see clear fluid behind it. So the question becomes, how do you treat this patient? And there's not necessarily a wrong answer, um, but um, if you think that this is CSF, perhaps you should start the work up already. What we will typically see clinically is steroids don't generally help, oral antibiotics don't help, it's not an infection. Um, with a myringotomy, often you see the fluid draining. Um, sometimes it stops, sometimes it continues, sometimes it's positional, sometimes it's not there upright. The patient lays down at night and it, um, and it drains or it drains on the pillow. Or you end up with a ring, often with a halo around the ring on the pillow, halo sign. Um, Myringotomy and tube, often these will drain just drain, 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 and then treat it with drops, and then you get itching, and then you get fungus, and then you get other sorts of things that happen. So that's not an uncommon presentation that I see in my clinic fairly commonly. Um, what's the pathology? What's the pathophysiology? Is it well understood? You could say it's not, but I think we have a pretty good understanding of, of what goes on. Uh, thin bone, perhaps to start, sometimes related to other things. Um, intracranial hypertension, pressure, pressure, pressure. Um, dural herniation, uh, dural slash brain herniation, or dural tear brain herniation. Various versions of meningocele or encephalocele or meningoencephalocele occur, and at some point spinal fluid can leak. Um, with arachnoid granulations up there, they may act as a reservoir for spinal fluid. Pressure, 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 pressure over years. Thin skull base to begin with, you get some uh, breakdown, and then it's sitting in one of those upper air cells and then decides to leak. Uh, we see a lot of inflammation with these in some patients and not much in others, uh, but often a lot of inflammation as well too. And sometimes you really see just things limited to the top part of the mastoid, and sometimes you will see a lot of this um, hanging down over the ossicles into the middle ear itself, even in down to the mastoid tip um, with, uh, with long-term pressure over time and a well-aerated mastoid, for example. Uh, it's been proposed that you have central venous obstruction, um, impairing uh, pressure, leading to buildup of pressure up here, and then uh, gradual pressure and erosion of the skull base over time. A fair amount of patients have sigmoid or transverse sinus thrombosis or narrowing. Um, perhaps you have hypercompliant uh, venous sinuses as well, blood flow changes up there. Some stenting is occurring um, in some patients with uh, problems over time of the transverse sinus. Um, it may very well that patients have an anatomical predisposition with thin bone or thin skull bases, um, and that, along with some of these other issues, may predispose a certain group to having problems. Doesn't necessarily propose, doesn't necessarily predispose a group to um, to morbid obesity, but but other things do, and um, multifactorial, um, no doubt. Obesity has been defined as a BMI greater or equal to 30 and morbid obesity over 35. Um, as you saw in a couple of those slides, um, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, uh, we see at times um, those patients have significant uh, health issues with BMIs uh, that high. And um, hypertension in the vast majority of patients, intracranial hypertension as well, um, whether, whether can be measured or the measurements off an LP actually hit target or not, I would say relative intracranial hypertension is, is essentially standard. Sleep apnea very common as well. Increased intra-abdominal pressures, venous flow problems, pressure problems up here. Um, 
We see other things with these patients. Unilateral pulsatile tinnitus is common. Flattenings of the back of the eye is common. We see some of this in patients with Meniere's disease also. You can see other terms up there that we see commonly uh, in our patients who are morbidly obese. Paper from a while back um, up in Connecticut and looking at um, spontaneous versus non-spontaneous CSF otorrhea. This was a nice early comparison about non-spontaneous um, patients much thinner on average than those who have spontaneous leak so this was this was earlier on where we were really starting to look at and see differences with these uh, with these groups of patients. And um, can't tell you about the patient population um, in Connecticut versus South Carolina, but I can hypothesize that we have higher rates of obesity and these other problems down here. Um, Interesting number in this particular group, average BMI almost 50. Um, that's, that's quite morbidly obese. So if 35 represents 75 to 100 pounds overweight, being, being female or male, uh, 48 is, is pushing much higher than that. So significant health problems in these groups also. So if we could actually conclude that morbid obesity leads to benign intracranial hypertension, at least in a certain uh, group, um, I, think that's, I think that's pretty fair. And uh, we do see temporal bone encephalocele's um, as well uh, in different parts of the temporal bone. And uh, again, the groups tend to be um, obese, which again, we assume is related to, uh, to these sorts of things. Nice little proposed um, pathway to encephalocele or pathway to CSF leak proposed there. Um, this particular paper was actually uh, looking at a similar thing, right? And again, as these papers started to come out, um, I think the link between obesity and spontaneous leaks versus non-spontaneous was um, uh, driving toward an etiological role of obesity being related. High female preponderance or predominance, maybe that's related to bone density, maybe that's related to um, underlying skull base thickness as well. We've actually tried to measure bone density here and we found that very challenging. We did not find significant differences in bone density based on based on houndstooth unit measurements in our different patient populations here. Uh, that study, I think we did as well as we could, but it's a lot of challenges. I think perhaps over time we will repeat that study and who knows, maybe we will find something. Let's keep going. Earlier studies also, again, middle-aged female patients, BMI. This stuff's fairly, um, I think, well understood and better understood now. Let's talk about some other things. Headache in this group is common. Um, and um, unilateral pulsatile tinnitus in this group is common with benign intracranial hypertension. With leaks, yes, of course, pulsating tinnitus on that side. Um, papilledema, it's recommended that we as otolaryngologists look in the backs of the eyes on patients. I will tell you I'm not very good at that, and I don't do that. I wasn't very good at that as a medical student. I got worse as a resident, and, um, and we have colleagues who are much better at, at this uh, than we are and who also have machines who can, who can do this as well. So um, we do think about um, neurology involvement. We think about neuro-ophthalmology or ophthalmology involvement as well. 
to get a good look at other things affected by um, benign intracranial hypertension. On MRI scan, radiographic imaging, um, you see a lot of empty cellas or partially empty cellas with this particular group um, as well. Very, very common. Uh, d, d criteria have been pro proposed looking at this for looking at intracranial hypertension. So patients have the signs and symptoms. Increased uh, ICP measured with a lumbar puncture. Again, I don't do lumbar punctures. Not many otolaryngologists do. Um, we often ask our neurologist to do this, and sometimes we, we uh, uh, struggle getting them to do it. But again, that's a, that's a physician's own decision whether to do this. Um, I, don't, I don't refer to neurology to do a lumbar puncture, right? We refer because we have concerns that the patient has issues, and then we, we would like them to evaluate the patient as they see fit. Uh, as we've said, empty cella, uh, pituitary gland is generally there. It's just not hanging down and um, doesn't mean that the patient has pituitary dysfunction either. But if neurologists or primary care have concerns about that, they should work that up. You see this sort of finding. CSF here being, being dark in this particular cut. Let's talk about CSF otorrhea. Um, you know, an encephalocele hanging into the ear, if it's not hanging on the ossicles or hanging on something that would cause hearing loss or, or pulsatile tinnitus, you might not know that it's, uh, that it's happening. Uh, but when we see pressure from a meningocele or an encephalocele or a meningoencephalocele, or we see fluid in the temporal bone, those patients present with unilateral hearing loss, and it's conductive in nature. Um, a serosotitis media means fluid, and um, if it's ear fluid, it tends to have a yellow tinge to it. Um, if it's from CSF, it's generally clear. You could also have an encephalocele hanging um, over ossicles or hanging toward the eustachian tube, and you could also develop a eustachian tube dysfunction or a, a more of a chronic serosotitis media picture with yellowish tinge. So you could have encephalocele not leaking, plus have a chronic serosotitis media on top of this. So this is stuff to think about in terms of your thought process and, and working through all of this. So oral fullness, uh, these won't generally drip unless they drip out the eustachian tube, back of the nose, salty taste. Um, but persistent otorrhea with a tube or a myringotomy suggest uh, this may be spinal fluid. And we see plenty of patients, unfortunately, who have developed meningitis with this or multiple bouts of meningitis. And um, that can be very, very problematic. Blindness, deafness. Um, uh, loss of loss of limb, loss of other problems, depending on what's affected by the meningitis. Uh, that is a photograph of a um, ear demonstrating an air bubble and what looks like quite um, clear fluid to my eye. And uh, there's your otoscopy. We have microscopes available. I suggest using them. It's helpful. And tuning forks should be done in clinic, showing conductive hearing loss. They may have sensory neural also, and sometimes the tuning forks are, are hard to tell what's going on. Evaluation of the nasopharynx is recommended. Um, at this point in time, I generally do not go to myringotomy as first choice. I generally go to a CAT scan not trying to uh, radiate the patients unnecessarily, but if I'm concerned for a leak, I'm going to look for a leak rather than collecting um, spinal fluid. I just collected spinal fluid recently, however, um, because the patient had a known history of a leak and we were trying to see if the patient was re-leaking, for example. But for me, CAT scan for many years has been initial um, test of choice. 
That's the conductive hearing loss in the right ear, normal hearing left, normal, um, normal uh, bone line. Um, this is demonstrating mask and right ear, but regardless, normal bone line and tuning force should go to the, Weber should go to the right. And Renee, maybe negative here, maybe, maybe equivocal, just depending on how much conductive loss the patient has and a flat temp. Uh, beta 2 is uh, not found in, in much tissue. Um, our lab here struggles with uh, telling us that we have enough material and the general response is not enough. Um, so you could add some saline to it, but sometimes then they find that it's too dilute. So from my understanding, they need very little, uh, very little spinal fluid to be able to have a positive um, test but our lab struggles. So even if the test is negative, if you have a high index of suspicion, you should think about CSF and then consider further workup, including CAT scan and MRI. Uh, imaging CAT scans generally first. Uh, our radiologists here tell us quite a bit, consider MRI, which we do uh, a fair amount, but um, uh, often just a CAT scan is really about all you need. Uh, cisternogram, uh, I wish I could say nobody's doing cisternography, but I don't think that's real, but these are fairly rare things at this point. This is an axial CT, for example, an lymphatic duct here on the right might be a little bit large, but uh, grossly normal. And on the left, we see gray, uh, which is some sort of fluid or soft tissue um, over here on the, on the patient's left side. This um, curvature of the sigmoid on the patient's right may give you some indication of intracranial hypertension, for example. Actually, it looks a little better on the left. Uh, this patient has a defect back here from prior surgery, right? Could cause problems. Uh, this might not leak out. This might leak into the ear, cause some hearing loss. Here's the tube, could even be leaking. Person's obviously had surgery back here in a plate. About half the mastoid was taken off for whatever skull base approach was done here and fluid coming into the mastoid. If it's not leaking out this direction, out the incision may very well cause problems and go the other direction, including out the eustachian tube and then drip, drip, drip out the nose or down the throat. Other side normal. When you're thinking about coronal CTs, most of us spend lots of time looking at axials, but uh, looking at coronal CT is also important. So the tegman is the roof and should be solid bone, not necessarily that net or cartoon, but a nice plate. And what we see is a ratty moth eaten appearance on a lot of patients. Uh, arachnoid granulations in these little pits could just be CSF, could be meningocele or encephalocele or both. Every once in a while we see um, defects in odd locations. So uh, even spontaneous, you can see Weaknesses or thinness with the IAC or the geniculate, posterior fossa, middle fossa is more common. But every once in a while you find these in, in uh, abnormal locations. That's the picture from Netter, right? Well, that's, that's what Netter used to make such beautiful artwork, right? Beautiful plate along the entire um, Tegman mastoidium here. And, and then if you come forward, Tegman tympani. Uh, this particular patient doesn't have much bone anywhere across here. And whether this is just spinal fluid or a meningocele or meningoencephalocele or encephalocele, hard to tell. MRI can be helpful. But ratty moth eaten appearance, but generally the skull base is right along here. Other side, normal, beautiful, crust. All right, Netter would be proud. And over here, this is plenty thick out here, ratty, moth-eaten, what's brain, what's spinal fluid, what's meninges slash dura over the heads of the ossicles, et cetera. This person may not be leaking, but this person certainly has conductive hearing loss from the uh, 
um, from the dura slash brain sitting on the heads of the ossicles. This is normal. This is thin, even though it's above the heads of the ossicles here, but this person's not having issues and this person's really missing bone and having problems because of that. And I don't know right here if this is the dura or the brain hanging down all this way or if this is body's inflammatory response, but clearly this is going to cause some headache, uh, some hearing loss, and this person's probably leaking. This looks like fluid down here in the lower part of the middle ear. Looks like a meniscus right there. Thick out here. Uh, this person's not having troubles, however, right? There's some thin spots here, maybe a little moth-eaten, right? Maybe a setup for problems down the road, who knows? And this person's leaking. Okay, so again, with normal, there's variation also, right? And um, this person may be thin to start with. This person here may be at risk, but this person's broken down. Thin. Nice crust. Okay, this one may very well be leaking or having problems. This one does not appear to be. You see lots of variation with this. Both of these patients seem to be pretty thin, at least with the head. Don't know BMI on these two. Nice, beautiful crust. If you hear me say crust in the operating room, this is what we're talking about. All right, heads of the ossicles, tensor, all looks good. Thin sitting brain sitting on ossicle conductive hearing loss may not be leaking should be no problems over here problem here see how thin this is all right all of this is probably worn down over time might have some similar issues over here just not a problem Um, Dr. Rizik did a nice study um, toward the end of his fellowship, maybe early when he started here. We actually looked at um, tegmin thickness with patients with superior canal dehiscence. So the thinness or the, the let's just say the tegmin was actually thinner in patients who had superior canal dehiscences than in patients who had CSF leaks. So that group certainly has congenitally thin skull base, which may also very well get worse over time um, with, with pressure up here. Those who happen to have both CSF leaks who happen to also have superior canal dehiscences had really, really thin skull bases, as you might imagine. So it's nice to see lots of these in terms of kind of average patients with relatively th thick skull bases, BMI less than 30. Uh, this one's fine actually, uh, but a thin crust here and a thin crust. CSF leak with superior canal dehiscence, really thin skull bases, lots of pock marks all around and superior canal dehiscence. All right, this is, this is stereotypical for a patient with a superior canal dehiscence. That skull base is just thin everywhere. If we go a little bit further, Tegman Timpani, right? Normal BMI, pretty good. BMI greater than 30, you see some thinning here and there. Patient with a CSF leak, some places are fairly thick, right? But thin happens to be leaking. And some of these folks, uh, superior canal dehiscence or a leak with a superior canal dehiscence, just everywhere is very thin. Okay, so. Our radiologists here see a lot of these patients. They are, they are really good at calling these and helping us out with it. Um, elsewhere, a general radiologist reading skull base films, um, they may struggle with this a little bit. This is very specialty intense, specialty specific. 
So make sure when you're seeing these things, even if the read looks good, to look at these things yourselves and um, get a good feeling for what's going on, especially if you have concern, if you're worried about meningitis, if you're thinking about surgery for one thing or another. This particular case, the right, forget the left, the right side is thin, 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 but not causing a problem and a little thicker uh, more medially. This patient on the left has a large defect and happened to present with meningitis and you can see there's fluid, brain, um, inflammation all the way down into the middle ear here also. Somebody got an MRI, right? So um, I think that's Walter's paper. Um, T2 is fluid. And this particular patient on the um, patient right side here, um, our left, shows fluid down in the mastoid. Okay, so has some defect along through here and then fluid because of this. Very common findings. When we see these folks, these are surgical problems. Not every patient wants surgery. Not every patient needs a middle fossa. Not every patient should be handled with a middle fossa. Not every patient should have, be handled with a mastoid approach. You can take different approach for, for different patients. Um, middle fossas uh, are not inherently much more risky in the right hands. Uh, but as we age, our dura gets thinner the brain gets less resistant, and, um, and we just want to be careful um, going through all of these. When we operate on patients with encephalocele, when we operate on patients with leaks, the average patient has a BMI of like 37, something like that, okay? If that's a male like me, that person's 100 pounds overweight. If it's a female, she's 75 pounds overweight, minimum. Many other comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, aspirin use, history of PE, on Coumadin at times, um, sleep apnea, CPAP machine, all of these things. These are inpatient surgeries. Medicaid, Medicare mandates that you code this inpatient, that you admit your patient. You don't necessarily have to admit. You can actually discharge from the recovery room but it's a planned admission. We generally keep patients in the hospital overnight. Some of our folks who I just do mastoid surgery on, really nothing intracranially except to seal things off, whatever we do. Um, many of them really need a couple of days in the hospital. They don't recover quickly from surgery. Their oxygen sats struggle. Um, I've seen post-operative PEs on, on at least one patient. They don't often come back to you with a PE. They're elsewhere in some hospital. So you hope that you have good uh, communication with your teams out there. Pre-op workup, how many need chest x-rays, EKGs? I don't know. I let my anesthesiology colleagues uh, handle this, but probably a higher than um, routine ear surgery percentage should have additional workup. CBCs, um, metabolic panels, etc. cetera. Um, again, a lot of our patients are on blood thinners. A lot of them have other issues, including higher risk of, of blood clots and PEs. So don't hesitate to get your other teams involved. Um, how we get there, um, again, experience what you're comfortable with, um, what you get good results with, um, what you need to see, where the defect is, can you actually get to it, and then the patient. Not telling us as surgeons what to do, but suggesting that as surgeons we think through this and we justify what we're doing. Uh, the last topic last couple of topics, what's used to repair a defect, natural materials, um, synthetic materials, again, what works best in your hands, what you have experience with, what's going to work for your particular patient. All of these are reasonable things to do depending on the situation.
Um, I've seen a fair amount of inflammation with some of the synthetic um, calcium uh, product material, whether that's the material, whether that's the patient, whether that's the nature of the disease, whether that's my technique, I don't know, but we've seen a fair amount of uh, inflammation, perhaps more in the past couple of years than, than others. Um, at a ANS meeting several years ago, there was a show of hands in terms of who's doing preemptive surgery, and it wasn't just a couple of hands went up. So um, I think that's a question for us to consider: is a skull-based defect with potentially an impending problem worth a preemptive surgery? I'm not going to make that judgment here. Um, but preemptive surgery has risk also, right? Risk of leak, um, risk of meningitis, risk of bleed, risk of stroke, et cetera. So um, should we be preemptively um, repairing a skull base or strengthening a skull base? Um, I leave that up to my colleagues to decide. I generally don't do that. Um, Doing transmastoid approach, um, you should be able to get to the Tegman mastoidium in most patients through the mastoid. I will argue you can get to most defects in the Tegman tympani also through a transmastoid approach. It's tough with a low Tegman. Sometimes you have to remove the heads of the ossicles. Um, how's the hearing going to be if you don't do that versus how's the hearing going to be versus you do that? And these are all things to think about as we go after these uh, defects surgically. Certainly, ear surgery is less invasive than middle fossa surgery. Um, but again, skill, expertise, comfort level, experience come into all of these decisions. Um, I've used this um, discussion with patients and with colleagues for years. Uh, if I have a pool on the roof of my house, I probably want me as the pool guy up in the pool fixing the pool. Probably going to be difficult to fix a pool not actually being in the pool. However, if the pool is somebody's brain, um, perhaps I would rethink that a little bit. We also don't want to do perform multiple surgeries on people or increase their risk of getting meningitis or increase their risk of a leak later on. Transmastoid, right? You do a mastoid, you find the hole and you repair it, right? So you'll see some just different, not a whole lot of pictures here, but this is a left ear, skull base is up here and somehow getting up here and repairing the defect fascia, cartilage, um, hydroxyapatite, fat, et cetera, depending on the defect. Horizontal ink is coming around to the, the middle ear here. Just some, just some fairly high resolution pictures, right? We've all seen this. We do these surgeries all the time. Cochlear implants, clustitoma, mastoiditis, approaches for skull base. Um, very common for otology and very, very common for neurotology. Often have middle ear to deal with. How far forward can you come? How high is the skull base in relation to the ear canal? Are there other things going on? You can have brain all the way down here under the ossicles. Um, middle fossa only and pulling all of this up may not, make, may not make sense, especially if it's entangled with the ossicles and can you get everything out? So I think multiple approaches, at least in the armamentarium, is worth thinking about. Middle fossa um, can be used for either approach. Um, needs to be in somebody's armamentarium. And are you going to cause further problems? Are you going to get better hearing results? Um, think about all of this, right? If you're doing brain surgery on a person, sometimes you do see brain, sometimes you really just see dura. And can you get medially if you need to? How much pressure, what type of retractor do you need to um, 
need to use? Um, how much pressure on the brain for how long? If there's tissue down in the masculine or down in the middle ear, can you get that out? And that's why sometimes a combination approach is, um, is also needed. How low the brain hangs, how high the ossicles are, what you need to um, separate all of that and hopefully allow the um, ossicles to vibrate reasonably is also something to think about. Different ways to do these things, incisions, etc., bone flap, and how you get up there, what you see for a defect, what's underneath, how you repair bone, HA, fascia, synthetic fascia, lots of different ways to do all of this. Do you need a retractor? How do you retract the brain? Uh, these cartoons are, are great. This is from Sam's paper. Um, much easier when you don't see blood, spinal fluid, and all of this other stuff that make our lives challenging as, as ear surgeons. And this person's got a beautiful plate of bone here that just fits beautifully and everything lays beautifully. And there's no way this one's gonna leak because this isn't a patient, it's a cartoon. So our struggles become uh, more challenging when we have reality to deal with. This is a superior canal that's beautifully covered with bone also. That's not what my average leak looks like. My average leak, the bone over here is like this. And Sam's average leak is also. He's just got a beautiful cartoonist uh, helping him out here. Looks more like this, right? Where's the hole? Where's the leak? What's coming? What's going on? Do we need a retractor or not, et cetera? And that's a more realistic picture also, right? Bleeding hole here, how big's the hole, what's underneath it, what are you going to put on there, is it going to sag down, are we going to have um, continued problems with, with leak afterward. That one looks pretty straightforward. I think, uh, I think that's fixable, that was probably fixable from below also. So we got a couple of minutes, do we put in a lumbar drain or not? Some do, quite often. Some programs actually use lots of shunts, even 50 or 75% of patients get shunts. We generally here do not put in a lumbar drain um, and we have a very good closure success rate. Um, a con of a lumbar drain, um, bed rest or at least monitor of the drain. You certainly don't want the drain leaking or God forbid, a lot of fluid coming out and then herniation to occur. Um, obviously, there's also risks of bleeding and infection and leaks um, in the lumbar area uh, with other sorts of things. Acetazolamide, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, we use this a lot. I don't generally use this before surgery, but we use this a lot after surgery. It, certainly does decrease CSF production, at least for a while for patient. Um, and how long do you get it and how much dose? And um, I find with several patients, they with numerous patients, they tell me it's expensive. And this medicine's been around for a long, long time and it should be, um, it should be inexpensive, but uh, we certainly don't control pharmacies and pricings and what drug companies do for their, um, for their medications. And um, as we've all seen, medications and pricing or price gouging has become commonplace. Um, uh, antibiotic or antibiotic steroid preparations for ear problems have gone through the roof. $300 a bottle to $500 a bottle is commonplace. And pharmacies get these for three, five, ten, twenty dollars. So um, that sort of price gouging also um, is common with these sorts of um, long-term generic medications. Don't know if that will ever go away. Um, Post-operative course in the hospital, right? If the patient goes home early, that's fine, but um, bill it as inpatient and um, we as surgeons should um, should collect for our work as should the hospital. 
Um, whether or not you allow the patient to eat overnight, I'm fairly cautious. Um, uh, patients have the rest of their lives to eat. Um, I've not seen starvation overnight with a one day stay in the hospital. Um, it may be uncomfortable or just a nuisance to the patient, but um, I, I urge caution just in case you have to do something. Early ambulation is good. Um, it is a challenge with, a, with an average patient population BMI of around 35 or 40, it's a challenge. With the other comorbidities, joint issues, CPAP, et cetera. I generally don't like Foley's in patients, but sometimes it's needed overnight. Um, generally steroids to help or, or perhaps mannitol. Um, giving somebody mannitol and not having a Foley in, um, that's, that's hard on the patient as well too. So, um, expected phone calls. I think this is important also, right? What if patients have severe headaches or spiking fevers? You worry about meningitis, you worried about uh, altered men and, men and, uh, altered men and mental status um, with meningitis. Um, we don't like to see copious amounts of drainage. If you're fixing the leak, you should not have drainage out the ear, drainage out any incisions. So these are things to, to be concerned about, especially at home. Um, short and longer term complications. All right, there are, if we do brain surgery, there are major problems that can happen. So cerebral edema, bleeds, hydrocephalus, meningitis, stroke, and, and um, down the list. So we need to think of ourselves as surgeons, right? So fevers generally early is not meningitis. It's generally uh, wind, water, wound, et cetera. But when we do brain surgery, we add those other things to the list because those things can have devastating consequences early. Um, your recurrence rate should be low. Meningitis rates, we want to be low. Pulmonary embolism. Um, certainly blood clots in the extremities is higher than any of us would like to admit. And when do you start blood thinners back or, or do you put patients on sub-Q heparin or when do you start? Conductive hearing loss post-op is common. And in my opinion, a relatively low amount um, or a, um, a small amount of conductive hearing loss should be acceptable. Um, that's easy to amplify with a hearing aid. Um, but um, a lot of hearing loss, uh, perhaps a second look because the chain's probably not vibrating very well. I think that's all I got, about an hour. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on with this, a lot of places making measures, looking at um, MRI scans, looking at eyes. Um, there's some literature coming out of um, neuro-ophthalmology field. The folks at Emory have done some nice work on this as well. Mallory worked with them as a, as a resident. Um, very interesting and very common these days in terms of what we see in otolaryngology and in neurotology. So I don't think we will be seeing less of this. I think as a field we will be seeing more and more and more. And I hope that we develop um, good working relations with our neurology colleagues, ophthalmology colleagues, neurology colleagues, neuroradiology colleagues, and, and neurosurgical colleagues. This takes a team approach. Thanks, Dr. Meyer. That was awesome. I got a question. Yeah, any thoughts or comments from the group? Hey, Dr. Meyer, it's uh, Dan Morrison. Um, I was curious how you approach the uh you mentioned the acetazolamide but the underlying issue of weight loss with these patients that can be somewhat of a difficult uh conversation and you know you definitely see folks who already had their anterior fossa and cephal seal repaired and you know they come back a couple of years later seen a few of them uh in alabama and uh they got in, now they have a <clears throat> middle fossa leak and maybe they were prescribed acetazolamide and they didn't take it and whatever but um how do you breach that conversation do you ever refer to those patients and just your take on that yeah um those those are challenging right getting patients to stop smoking is challenging also re regardless of of what's here um 
We probably do a better job with nutrition with our patients with Meniere's disease, frankly, than we do with this particular group. Um, we've got a we've got a better team set up for that. Um, we've made re many referrals over the years, um, many discussions with primary care. Um, primary care within our system, for example. Um, I'm seeing, for example, more of these patients come in with diagnosis of obesity or morbid obesity, which I think is good. I don't know exactly how that is addressed. Um, we see more and more patients with um, procedural work to help with their morbid obesity, right? Some sort of stomach staple, ruin Y, whatever, whatever is done. Um, so perspective, I th at this point, in my facility, I believe that the weight loss surgeons have done four to five times more weight loss surgeries than we have done cochlear implants. We have a pretty large cochlear implant program. We're, we're way over 1,500 now, and I think the weight loss surgeries over the same period of time is six, seven, eight thousand. So, um, so weight loss is clearly important. Weight loss in a certain population is statistically very, very unlikely. And, um, and some of these other things come into play. And um, it's, not a, it's not a, um, it's a medical problem, right? It's a medical or surgical problem. And I think, unfortunately, um, I mean, we all kid about a variety of things in our, in our lives, right? We as people aren't necessarily all that nice, but this is not a weak mind, a morality issue, anything like that. It's a serious medical problem. And if um, if 75 pounds overweight is not correctable or 100 pound weight, uh, weight uh, loss is not correctable, then I think we also need to think about other things for our patients. Um, uh, sleep apnea, for example, surgeries for sleep apnea, including um, the implantable devices, um, is a huge thing right now. I have no doubt in town here, we are doing more sleep um, sleep related type implant surgeries than we're doing cochlear implants. And uh, hearing loss is certainly more common, um, but significant hearing loss requiring cochlear implantation is less common than morbid obesity, sleep apnea, diabetes, hypertension, all those things by orders of magnitude. So, um, yeah, these approaches, uh, right, health care, nutrition, dietary referrals, we do take advantage of all of these, but unfortunately at some point they get to us with a problem, a leak, or they get to a problem with us with meningitis. And then the question becomes, what's the risk of catastrophe uh, versus risk of doing this and then trying to address other sorts of things? And that's a, that's a challenge. I'm not really trying to avoid the question, Dan, but these are, these are tough problems. And, um, you know, patient in my hospital with meningitis, I'm not going to fix the skull base leak when they're in the hospital with meningitis, right? We're going to treat them aggressively four, six, eight weeks, whatever. We're going to hope that they're not um, homeless without funding and they will actually come back and give us a chance to address this. Because unfortunately, that's another population that's out there is that the folks are lost to follow up. And sometimes that's just a resource issue or sometimes that's a lack of understanding of what the problem is. We didn't know about the patient in the hospital or the team didn't know about what the what the cause was. So these these sorts of patients present lots and lots of challenges. And whether you live in Alabama, Virginia, U New York, or wherever you live, um, obesity and CSF leaks are a major problem these days. Good question. Thank you. Major problem. I got a question, Dr. Meyer. Yeah. Um, you see a patient with a, an obvious uh, CSF leak or encephalocele, but also concurrent SSCD on the same side, some like vague symptoms, you know, headache, pulsatile tinnitus, disequilibrium or some dizziness. How do you approach um, either like workup uh, of that patient and consideration of whether you should fix the SSCD or not? Yeah. Um, 
Are they actively leaking? You said yes, yeah, so I'll use that as a. I'll use that as a. You, you know you're going to fix the the yeah. defect, but the question is, you know, are they really symptomatic from the SSED, and do you, you know, do you get a VEMP or, you know, even if you do get a VEMP, how do you interpret that in the context? Yeah, that's that's a good question, right? And for example, with straight SCCD. Um, with the conglomeration of the variety of, of um, symptoms that can occur, don't always occur, right? And some patients are more otol some patients are more hearing otologic problems, and some are more vestibular otologic problems, right? And some are more concerning, right? Loud sound fall down uh, versus, eh, I don't like how it sounds muffled in my ear. Um, that's even more challenging when you add fluid to this. So. Um, as as good as, for example, as some of the models are with with flow and um, all of this, I don't know how well that's actually understood with inner ear fluid flow plus extra extra axial fluid right now in the ear with all of that. So they may have more symptoms than they're actually demonstrating, but they're muffled because of the um, or they're they're reduced because of the spinal fluid. So um, generally, um, I talk about fixing the problem, and who knows if that if that um, superior canal dehiscence was actually a problem for them before all of this, right? Because if you've described, I'm going by your description, vague, dizzy, whatever, right? Who actually knows? So um, certainly any ear surgery, there's a risk of hearing loss, there's a risk of taste problems and facial paralysis, um, dizziness, vertigo, all of that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, one of the questions is, do I need to get to the middle fossa in the first place to fix this? And the second question is, where's the actual canal defect versus the skull base and where's the leak occurring? So uh, I can get quite forward by doing ear surgery without doing middle fossa on most people. Um, however, right, this this is now maybe a little different. Low skull base, ossicle is going to be right here. All right, I know I don't have the scale right, but ossicle is going to be right here. How do we do all of this and then not address the, the defect up here? Uh, that's a challenge. I generally tend not to fix that defect, generally. Um, and generally, if that's the case, I don't find those patients to have too many problems. Canal, um, canal dehiscence related types of problems. Um, a related type question might also be, right, what if you see things hanging down on a skull base defect but, and, a, and a superior canal dehiscence, but they're not leaking, right? You don't necessarily have impending doom going on. You may have gotten this for some other reason. And then how much of that do you need to address also? And I think that probably would be a great um, a great panel discussion for an ANS, and I'll bet you you're going to get about 30 or 40 different opinions stated as fact. All right, this is how you have to do that because this is how we talk about these things. And the person next to that person is probably going to be doing this on the panel and saying, nope, I wouldn't do that. I don't think you need to do that. So um, we have a lot of science going into this with a lot of very talented um, very smart people trying to figure this out, and I don't think it's a I don't think it's a one way fix. I think the, this is a complicated multifactorial problem with multifactorial um, solutions or options. Thanks, Dr. Meyer. Yes, ma'am. All right, guys. Well, good. Um, Good. Well, the discussion lengthened it a little bit, but I think we're well within our time period. So those of us uh, MUSC, um, uh, I have a faculty meeting in the main room, so your, um, your stuff is virtual.